Turner. Good evening, everyone. Yes, it's a very exciting occasion. Um, so I guess you know the format. There's five of us. We're going to have 15 minutes each. Um, I, we've, we've had the jokes. I think that there's room for one more joke. That uh, you know, the, uh, Dallas Campbell, one of the the, the uh, uh, contributors. In fact, Dallas was hoping to be here this evening, but he had to uh, go away for filming. Um, in his contribution in the book, he says something like half of the internet is devoted to UFOs, alien abductions, conspiracy theories. I. I'm not sure if it's half, but, you know, a lot of... of, of and the, the other half, I think, is pornography. Um, <laughs> but this notion that conspiracy theorists, you know, have that somehow aliens are already among us. No, don't worry about, you know, whether or not alien life exists. They're here, they're... Well, it's possible, it's true. In fact, one of them just took on the most important job <laughs> in the world today. Um, um, I wanted to say a little bit about the book and, and the, uh, uh, the project and how it came about and say something about some of the, uh, uh, the areas that we cover that are not going to be covered by um, the other four uh, speakers this evening. Um, Profile Books came to me uh, last year and said that they wanted to put together this, uh, a book um, on the possibility of extraterrestrial life and whether life exists elsewhere in the universe and call it aliens, and that's great, Boop, you know title, um, and, uh, and, and I had this wonderful job of just calling up on mates and colleagues and experts in, in various fields uh, to, to contribute, to write 3,000 word essays. Uh, so these are the, 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 the 20 chapters in the book, me plus 19 others, uh, on various aspects of, of the possibility of extraterrestrial life. Everything from the psychology of why so many people think they may have been abducted by aliens or seen uh, flying saucers or whatever, uh, and, and what, what sort of delusions they have and how that can be explained, to the, the, the possibility of, of, of life elsewhere, to the, the, the latest research in astrobiology uh, and exploration of the solar system and other star systems beyond, to see if there's evidence of life other than here on Earth. But also, that then opens up this whole area of, well, how probable is it for life to have emerged? We know that life emerged pretty quickly on Earth as soon as the conditions here were, were, were favorable, as soon as it was cool enough, you know, give or take the odd, you know, a few hundred million years, um, life started on Earth, so it started very quickly. So, what would, so is it very special? If it's not very special, how come we don't find the rest of the universe teeming with life? Maybe it is. Why don't we see it? Um, and so even down to... So the book is almost a, a sort of interdisciplinary look at the subject. It's, it's, it's serious science, but then it's interspersed with more fun stuff. Dallas Campbell writes about why, uh, why so many people believe they, you know, they, they have been uh, visited by aliens, uh, how did it all start, how did you know, the, the whole flying saucers um, um, idea begin in the late 1940s. Ian Stewart, one of the most prominent and, and, and best-known mathematicians and popularizers of mathematics in this country, happens to also be a science fiction buff. He has thousands of science fiction books. So he writes a chapter all about how we depict aliens in, in, in books, in science fiction. And then Adam, who's here this evening, who's a, who's a geneticist and a broadcaster, but also, as, as I'm sure he will, uh, will talk about in, in his 15 minutes, um, has a lot to say about how we depict aliens in the movies and how, how we anthropomorphize, how Hollywood uh, uh, describes aliens and so on. So interspersed among the hard science is, is the, the, these sort of lighter areas, but really bringing together the excitement that I think everyone feels about the possibility of extraterrestrial life. Um, in the green room just now, I was talking to Lewis Dartnell, and he said, the one thing I hate people talking about is the Fermi paradox and the Drake equation. Well, that's, my, that's, that's the next slide of mine. Um, Enrico Fermi, uh, Italian-American nuclear physicist, he was one of the, 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 the founders of, of uh, atomic and nuclear physics in the 1920s, 1930s, first person to carry out a controlled chain reaction in Chicago. Um, he was working at uh, um, uh, Los Alamos in New Mexico, 
uh, home of the famous Manhattan Project. But this was around about 1950, still a top security research establishment. And he was in the canteen lunchtime, and the story goes that he was talking to various other scientists about this, the craze. It just it complete, you know, um, people everywhere since the late 1940s were seeing flying saucers. Uh, and, and so he just raised this very simple question. He said, look, you know, if um, the universe is teeming with life, uh, let's assume that those who are seeing flying saucers are delusional and that there hasn't been any, uh, any visits from, from alien uh, civilizations to Earth. Where then is everyone? Assuming the universe is so vast, potentially infinite in extent, um, there's been enough time, billions of years, um, for, for life to emerge on, on, on planets in other star systems, how come no one has bothered to come and visit us? You know, where is everyone? It became known as the Fermi Paradox. Of course, it's, it's easy to dismiss, but it's captured the public imagination. You know, it, surely, surely there must be some intelligent life out there, and surely it'd want to come and, and visit us. Maybe not after today. Maybe the Earth is not quite such a nice place that people would want to come for their package holidays from other planets. Um, the other thing, so the other thing Lewis said never uh, mention is, is the Drake equation. Uh, again, it captured the imagination. Um, uh, Frank Drake, I don't know how many of you know, but, but he, he um, essentially kick-started what's called the SETI uh, movement, Search for Extraterrestrial uh, Intelligence. Um, he, he took, not seriously, but really, as, almost as a PR exercise, he came up with this equation that provides the, poss the, you know, the number at the end is the, the potentially how many intelligent civil alien civilizations could exist out there. By just by multiplying out probabilities, by n the number of known stars in the galaxy, how many of them at that time was, were known to have um, planets going around them, how many of those planets would have been in, in, in what's called the Goldilocks zone, that's uh, that, that, uh, you know, that conducive to potential for life, what are the chances of, of life emerging on those planets and evolving into intelligent life that could create technologies that will build um, spaceships that will come and visit us? And he came up with a number of, you know, something like 50,000. It's a meaningless number because almost all of those numbers that he multiplied together were guesses. Some were educated guesses, others were just complete random. They could have been out by, by many, many orders of magnitude. Uh, well, in our book, um, Sarah Seeger, uh, who, who works at MIT, comes up with a, a more um, modern version of the Drake equation, the Seeger equation. But again, she says, look, there are some numbers we know a lot more now about how many stars have, have planets, what the chances are that those fractions are, you know, are rocky planets, uh, that uh, are Earth-like, as we say, that may have atmospheres, may be having liquid water, may harbor life, what are the chances of, of life emerging on them, and so on. So, you know, we, we, we have a better idea now of putting in more sensible numbers and creating a new equation, which is called the Seeger equation, uh, but rather getting a number of 50,000, her answer is one. Now, she doesn't mean there's exactly one other alien, intelligent alien civilization out there, which is just showing that, that you know, it's, it's not zero, and it's not in, uh, near infinite, uh, but it's really hard. It's really difficult to find any other life out there if we're just looking out to space and listening out to space. Now, Carl Sagan uh, wrote uh, a famous book, Contact. Um, in fact, it, it triggered, um, it, it, he sent the manuscript to another physicist, Kip Thorne, who is, I guess, the leading expert on, on, on Einstein's theory of relativity, and said, you know, what do you think? I've got the story about we make contact with alien civilizations, and Kip Thorne gave him the idea of, of, of a wormhole that you could, that is a shortcut through, through space. Um, and um, uh, then the, the, his book, Contact, became a movie starring Jodie Foster and a, a young Matthew McConaughey behind her. Um, and, and the reason I mention this, but so basically the, the premise of the story is that aliens, you know, we're listening out, we've, we've got our radio telescopes pointing out to space, as, as the SETI uh, project has, listening for any signals coming from potentially alien civilizations, and, um, and we hear something and there's a message sent back and it's an instruction manual for how to build um, a wormhole to go and, and visit them anyway. I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen the film, Contact, it's very good. Um, well, the character that Jodie Foster plays is based on a real-life uh, astronomer, Jill Tarter. 
who was head of the SETI uh, program for many years. She's retired now. I had the privilege of meeting her this summer. Um, uh, and um, part of this, the, you know, the, 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 uh, trying to answer the question of whether intelligent life exists elsewhere in the universe is basically pointing our radio telescopes and listening, listening to any sort of electromagnetic uh, uh, signals coming from deep space. After all, we on Earth have been radiating out our noise and chatter for a century now since radio and television. Um, uh, it depends on if there is alien intelligent life out there. It depends how far away it is as to you know, what sort of broadcast they're hearing. You know, if it's uh, you know, 70, 80 light years away, then they're just now hearing speeches by Adolf Hitler. So uh, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, so they say, you know, 70 years from now, they'll be hearing speeches by Donald Trump. Um, uh, uh, but we've been pointing our telescopes out into space, and so far we've heard nothing. There's, there's been the odd little bit of excitement, uh, but so far uh, we, we, we've not heard anything. But asking the question of whether there's life elsewhere in the universe doesn't necessarily require that life to be sentient, to be intelligent, uh, to, to, to be technologically advanced enough to send signals or indeed to build spaceships to come and, and visit us. For most scientists, it would be just as mind-numbingly amazing to discover that some form of life, that life emerged somewhere else other than here on Earth. Because it suggests it, it, it would be the equivalent revolution in science as Copernicus saying the Earth is no longer the center of the universe. It's just another it's a planet going around a star, uh, and later it was discovered that star is just an ordinary star among many in, in, in the galaxy. And there are many galaxies. Uh, so it, it sort of takes away from underneath our feet this notion that we are somehow special and privileged. If we knew there was microbial life, for example, somewhere else in the universe. It doesn't have to be alien life that can build spaceships. Um, of course, what we hear a lot of the news, and I don't want to say too much about this because I know certainly um, Lewis and Louisa, as the two astrobiologists on, uh, on this evening, will say something about, about, about this, I guess. But the, a few months ago, there was the, the excitement of discovering an Earth-like planet very nearby, relatively nearby by, by um, uh, astronomical uh, proportions, just a few light years, four light years away, a planet Proxima b, um, orbiting the, the nearest star to our solar system. Um, uh, and uh, well, I, I, when you say artist's impression, I'm not quite sure what knowledge that artist had. <laughs> there may have been a bit of license involved there. But the notion is that so, so the, the, so Proxima b, this, this, uh, the, the, this uh, planet that we think is, is Earth-like in the sense that it's, it's solid and, and uh, Maybe within the sort of the, the Goldilocks zone of its star system, it may be that there is liquid water there. Um, it's exciting because it suddenly opens up the possibility that if there is life elsewhere, it might be might not be so far beyond our reach. When when Enrico Fermi uh, posed his paradox, where is everyone? The simplest glib answer is, well, the, the universe could be teeming with life but it's hundreds, thousands, millions of light years away. There's just no way that, you know, provided there are no um, surprises in the laws of physics that suggest that the speed of light can be exceeded, uh, then it's just, it just takes too long for any aliens to come and visit us. Um, but to, the potential of not necessarily them visiting us, but even us visiting them at some point in the future, just four light years away, opens up that, that, that possibility. Uh, and of course, in a few years' time, uh, we're going to have the, uh, the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Telescope, that's going to be able to look out into the, into the cosmos with ever-increasing detail. And what's really exciting now, you, you, you hear about the you know, discovery of these extrasolar planets. So an extrasolar planet is a, is a planet orbiting a star other than our sun, outside our solar system. The discovery that these planets exist in itself is exciting because... The, you know, the, the, when the, the first um, way we discovered that they existed was simply by changes in, the, in the, intent, the brightness of the light of the star as the planet moves in front of it. Tiny little planet compared with its star, but there's a slight reduction in the amount of radiation arriving here. We are now at the point where we can even carry out spectroscopy, analyzing the light from the star when the planet moves in front of it 
and that light passes through potentially an atmosphere that the planet may have. Because as the light passes through the atmosphere and arrives here on Earth, it will carry within it the signature of the chemicals in that atmosphere. And there are certain chemicals that we would believe are, would only exist if they were created by, by, by life itself. Now, I don't know how many of you remember, but um, back in the late 90s, there was a huge excitement that we may have discovered um, evidence of fossilized life on Mars, a fossilized microbe uh, from the um, uh, Allen Hills meteorite, a piece of rock that we believe it came from Mars. And, um, sorry, the phone's distracting me completely. Uh, uh, and under an electron microscope, uh, uh, scientists suggested that this, that this, this uh, is this a light here? Um, Possibly, yeah. Uh, okay, so that, that was some sort of microbe that's fossilized in the rock. Uh, some might argue the jury's still out, but I think most scientists would, would say that, no, it's not, it, there's nothing biological about that. It's, it's, it's just some crystalline structure. It's not very interesting. But, as you will hear from talks tonight, there is still the possibility that there may have been some form of potentially microbial life on Mars many uh, millions, billions of years ago, and possibly even life in one of the moons of, of the, the gas giants and uh, out to reach the solar system around, around Saturn uh, uh, and Jupiter. So there is a lot of excitement going on uh, and, and, uh, out there in astrobiology, but I think probably the, what we also really need to understand is what is special about life on Earth? How did life on Earth begin? What was that step that took chemistry to biology? Was it a magical step or was it inevitable? Was there some other point further down the line between simple single cell life to multicellular complex life, with Darwinian evolution kicking in, leaving, leading to, to, to us? Um, was that the, the, the really difficult step? Was that unique to this planet? We don't know, but we'd assume that given the sheer number of potential places where life could exist, it's, it, it's not inevitable but it's highly likely that life would exist um, elsewhere. And, and that's what's exciting about this book, that I've brought together people who will know a lot more about this subject than me, uh, who, who are, who, whose day job is researching uh, uh, in, in these areas, uh, to, to really give the, the, to the cutting edge. If the book goes, you know, sits on the shelf with all the other sort of new age books and conspiracy theories and UFOs, great, I don't care. It's great for sales. Um, but there's some really cool science inside. Uh, and I think I should stop there now. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will now introduce some of my, my team aliens. So, um, oh yeah, you should clap for me. 